Festival is a significant event on campus when all members of the community have the opportunity to come together to celebrate the value of scholarship, both here at SUU and throughout academia. In today's event, we'll have the opportunity to hear from someone who has deep experience in learning both the academic and theoretical side of ways to apply new knowledge to industry, as well as the applied side and how that new knowledge can help create productivity. I want to take a minute and thank our executive committee who helped schedule today's events. We had more than 100, 100 people presenting um, their research at events throughout this morning and this afternoon all across campus in each of our colleges and schools. The committee chair, Dr. Bill Hayborn, has pulled together these events. We'd also like to thank um, our chair from business, Dr. Jeff Swigert, from the College of Engineering and Computational Sciences, Laurel Dodgecoin, from the College of Education and Human Development, Brian Nilsson and Clint Broadbent, the College of Health Sciences, Kevin Tipton, College of Sciences, Dr. Jason Kaiser, and from Humanities and Social Sciences, Dr. Jessica Tavorti, the Library Honors, Christopher Clark, from the College of Performing and Visual Arts, Dr. Richard Bug. We'd also like to express our appreciation to Dr. Lynn Vartan, who does such a great job leading our APEX events, and Dr. Matt McKenzie for his support from online teaching and learning. The keynote, which we will give our speaker a thorough introduction, Dr. Roy will in just a minute. But I just want to make one mention of one thing you'll probably hear about today, and that is the name Dr. Edward Deming. Edward Deming is maybe the most well-known person for an ability to translate a decades, some 50 dec or 50 year long career in academia into industry. His ideas were honed in Wyoming and Colorado when he had the chance to go to school here and then on to Yale. But through his career, he was one of the unique people who was able to advance a field of knowledge in very pure disciplines in the sciences and take that information and allow it to be transitioned into application in industry. He is probably one of the most widely known and widely used scientists in this area. We are so fortunate to have experts and relatives of his here today to share with us a little bit about that perspective. And at SUU, that is our goal to carry on that same mantra, that scholarship is incredibly valuable and we get the chance to participate in the creation of new knowledge we also get the chance to use that knowledge to better the human experience in, in and outside of industry. So that's what we're here to celebrate today. It's my opportunity now to welcome Dr. Ravi Roy here to introduce our guest speaker. Thank you. Every three to four years, Lynn affords me the uh, privilege of speaking at this exact podium for one reason or another, and it's at that time that I remember I need to upgrade my prescription for my glasses. Um, so I want to uh, introduce our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Paula Marshall, and I'll do so in a minute after the gracious remarks by our, our provost. Um, uh, she has joined us here today, and she was uh, she flew in on her citation last night under some dicey weather uh, on her own time, on her own dime, and uh, I want that to be acknowledged uh, because this shows how uh, wonderful people are at the Deming Institute to give so graciously of their time and to build this partnership with Southern Utah uh, University. And while her son Jacob couldn't be here today because he was pressing business, he wanted to be here as well. Um, I want to give special thanks to President Benson. Provost Anderson, Dean Jean Bruin of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, and indeed all the deans for whom uh, this particular APEX uh, event needs to be sponsored by. I'd also like to thank the political science CJ chairman, uh, Kevin Jacobson. I'd like to thank our guests, distinguished guests from the Deming Institute whom, with whom we partner, including Kevin Cahill, Dr. Bill Bellows and, and their team, and of course, Lynn, you always put on a first rate uh, experience at these APEC events, and you and your team deserve a round of applause for that, as always. And of course, why do we do all this? Why are we here? That's the question that Dr. Deming used to ask, and we do it for the students and to learn and have fun. Um, 
So now on to our speaker. Dr. Paula Marshall was named the CEO of her family business, the Bama Companies, in 1985. Bama provides frozen baked goods to large-scale restaurant chains, including the nation's largest hamburger chain, the nation's largest pizza chain, and the nation's largest retailer. Paula received her Bachelor of Science in Business and her Doctorate of Commercial Science from Oklahoma City University. While at the helm of Bama, Bama Marshall has grown the organization to a $300 million company, all while putting a precedent on quality. Bama won the prestigious Malcolm Baldrige Award for quality in 2004 from the United States Department of Commerce and has been hailed as a leader in the baking industry. Marshall has served as chairman of the Tulsa Chamber of Commerce and was one of the first women uh, to, asked to join the Young President's Organization Oklahoma chapter in 1990. In 1993, she was named one of the top 10 CEOs by Industry Week magazine. She was selected Entrepreneur of the Year by Ernst & Young in 1997. In 1998, she was named to the Oklahoma Department of Commerce Business Hall of Fame. Recently, she was nominated as the Oklahoma's uh, Most Admired CEOs by the Journal Record. In 2021, she was profiled in, C in CEO magazine, The Life of Pi, Paula Marshall. So before I invite Paula to come up and, and give her remarks today, I want to invite each and every one of you to uh, have a deeper experience uh, tomorrow, uh, beginning at 8 a.m. at the Aviation Hangar. We, uh, we have our annual uh, W.O.S. Deming Bryce Canyon Society Forum that's devoted to the teachings of Dr. Deming. And, we, and to have someone like Paula be able to join us at this event um, and be able to speak and be able to interact with our students and faculty and members of the community is just a wonderful privilege and we are honored. So without further ado, Dr. Paula Marshall. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Good afternoon, everybody. I wanna start out by just saying thank you for coming and giving up some of your time as students to come listen to now. I'm like the oldest person in the room. I don't know when it happened. I don't know where it happened. I don't know how it happened. But I know I used to be the young pup in all these meetings. And when I first met Dr. Deming, I was the young pup. And it was so much fun growing up and being able to apply all of Dr. Deming's teachings to me, to the business as a young person and just really revolutionizing and transforming what business is. But most of you guys probably weren't even born in 1993, much less 1987 or 86. So you only know transformation. You only know what it's like to be able to speak your mind and to be valued for who you are and to be the person that you are. And it hasn't always been that way in business. In fact, it's still tough in business. And so I was always looked at as kind of an oddball. You know, like, is this person really going to be able to do what she says she's going to be able to do with people and be able to get them to do the things that we need to do to make quality happen in a workplace? And I realized very early on the only way I was going to be able to do that was to become one of them. So you can't run a business, whether it's today, yesterday, or tomorrow, by sitting in some big grand office somewhere and giving edicts and instructions to people. That's one of the best things that I ever learned from Dr. Deming was, the people are where it's at. People who work in the company, in the, in, on the machines, with the dough, in my case, with the products, and the other thing he told me, which I want to challenge you guys to start asking your professors, are we having joy here? Are we having fun here? Are you guys having fun learning? Because if you're not, you're not fully learning. Because we're going to talk a little bit about the fear and what happens when people get afraid in a workplace. They shut down. They get afraid, they won't speak their mind, they won't be who they are, they won't share their opinions. And you know what? If you don't have joy in the workplace and you don't have people willing to share their opinions about what's going on, then you lose the magic. And that's what the, one of the best things that Dr. Deming ever taught me is work should not be hard. 
Work should be joyful. So I spend a lot of my time and a lot of my energy with my teams in the plants, on the production floor, with them, digging into where the problems are and how can I, as the CEO, help them do better. Because what I've learned, and I'm going to take you through some of these conversations that I've had, but what I've learned in my little family business as we started out was I'm not going to make very many pies in a day, but they are. I'm not going to make very many biscuits in a day, but they are. So why don't we spend our time having fun while we do all this work, while we're all together for all these thousands of hours before we go back to heaven someday, which you guys aren't even thinking about that right now because you're young and you don't think that's ever going to happen to you, but it will, I promise. But anyway, let me spend a couple of minutes trying to help you understand why I would be here sharing my story with you and why I'm so grateful for you to be here to share this time with me. Because it's, it's, it's a one-on-one -on -one thing in this universe. It takes somebody willing to listen and somebody willing to speak and teach, right? And then we've got to reverse those roles. So someday think of yourself as teaching others and having others sit and listen to what you have to share and respect that. So I came from a family business. Our family started out with, before my grandparents, obviously, but my grandparents were like the central part of our family's structure because they were the ones who started out making the pies in our business. And ultimately, our business was founded by my father. And most of you guys will be like, what? You're going to say, I didn't know I'd been eating this woman's products for all the years of my life. But when you find out who we make products for, you're going to go, oh my gosh, we've been eating products from this company our whole lives, and we didn't even realize it. So that's why I like to have fun when I go to college campuses. I like for you guys to have fun because guess what? Food is fun. How many of you guys bake or have ever helped your moms bake or have ever gone into the kitchen here at, at the university and tried to see what goes into the making of your food? Anybody care about that? A few of you? Thank you. Thank you. You'll relate to me then. But among other things, we have plants in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We also have plants in China, in Poland, in the UK. So we make food. We make millions of these things right here every day. 3.5 million of those things right there every day. And guess who our largest customer is for those things? The Golden Arches. Do you guys know what that is? <laughs> what? What? You guys make biscuits for McDonald's? Oh my God, I eat those things twice a week, right? Well, maybe you guys don't, but I was so happy to hear there's a McDonald's here. So everyone can have an opportunity to eat a biscuit if they want to, and you know where it came from, right here, from my company in Tulsa, Oklahoma. 3.5 million of those every day, and then this little product right here. You ever heard of that product? You ever been to McDonald's for lunch or dinner and had the picture of a pie on the ordering thing? Yep. McDonald's hot apple pies? Mm -hmm. We make those. We make those in every one of our facilities around the world. We make six million of those apple pies every single day. So just imagine doing business with this big food giant company and they tell you that every single one of those has to be within a certain specification and every single one of those has to be within a certain specification and it has to taste the same and look the same and be the same within a mild amount of variation. 
how do you get 2,000 team members in one organization that are spread out all over the world to do that? Well, I can tell you, I had some stumblings and bumblings along the way because when you're young and you're all a big zealot and you're trying to run around, maybe my communication wasn't so good as it, as it is now because we've laid down a foundation of deming around our teams. Maybe it's a little better today because we've been at it for so many years. But I'm telling you, this is tough. So doing business with giant global corporations that have these demands is tough. And I fell, I fell off the quality wagon. In the middle 1990s, I fell off with some really serious problems that happened to our products and that happened then to affect the McDonald's restaurants. And I got a visit from them. They came to see me in their big jet filled with a lot of big, important people. And they said, OK, here's the deal. If you don't start making this stuff right, we're going to have to go bye-bye. It was very plain. So have you guys ever gone to class and gotten an F? I'm sure no one in here has ever gotten an F, right? How about a D? Anybody ever gotten a D? Anybody ever failed a class? <laughs> Told you you had to take it over? Well, that's when you, when you get that message, you, you know you're kind of done, right? Like, one more screw up, and it's bye-bye. Broken up with a boyfriend, a girlfriend, uh, ended a relationship of some kind. Those are difficult discussions, right? Nobody ever wants to have that happen. So they actually took me, the head of quality for all of this big global corporation said, we want to try to help you and we want to try to save your, I'm going to come back to that. <clears throat> we want to try to save your company because we believe in you. And I said, okay, how are we going to do this? And he said, we're going to take you to a seminar by this guy named Deming. And I had never heard, never heard one word. I had no idea who this person was. And the reason why it was so important was because McDonald's was going with me. And I asked them, why is it so important for you to come with me? Why aren't you just sending me? to this. And they said, because we want to send such a message to our supply community of how we want things done, that if we can get your company, which is the worst company we have in our whole supply chain. <laughs> I mean, I heard it right from the top of the company. You are the worst. So that's almost worse than getting a DNF. It's, it's, it's probably like looking at your paper and realize your F is there, and you look across the aisle, and that person has an A+, plus, and you kind of want to just go like that. And I'm like, oh, gosh. Well, I guess it was great that they told me. So I said, OK, I'll go. Absolutely, I'll go. So before I get into that, let me go back to this and just tell you all that I'm also a girl. I guess you guys have figured that out. I'm a she. I'm a girl. I'm a woman. And women don't typically get these jobs. I mean, today, even today, with all of the women out there working and working and working in business, there's still less than 20 CEOs that are women in the Fortune 100. Now, there's a lot of factors for that, just like there's a lot of factors for me being in this job. But I will just say, this was my fate and this was my destiny because my father and my older brother got sick at the exact same time and had to take hiatus from the business. My other brother wasn't capable of doing it. And I was the default. So you can imagine your dad, who's been telling you all your life, I don't really think this is for you to be this 
CEO thing. I think it's too hard. I think you should go, you know, work in, work in an office or do something that, you know, you don't have to do all this hard work. And I said, but what if I want to? And he said, well, we'll talk about it later. We'll talk about it later. So dads and girls have special relationships. That's just the way it is. So I was, I was the last kid, and I was the only kid that was willing to take instruction from him, listen to him, and do what he asked me to do. So I won't tell you that at 24 or 5 or whatever, I was absolutely the smartest, the best, the right person for the job, had the right resume. I had no resume. I had nothing, except I was the last kid, and I was the girl, and I listened. And I tried to carry out what my dad asked me to do. So that's important, OK? Because listening is something that has helped me save the company for all these years since we got in trouble with the McDonald's Corporation. Going to see Dr. Dimming was like a highlight of my entire career. I still think about it. I still talk about it. I'll never forget that day that I went with the guys from McDonald's. And I'm sitting in the audience. And Dr. Dimming says, are there any CEOs in this room? So the room we were in was at General Motors. It was a huge room. There were probably 500 people in the room. He's this guy that looks like that. He's standing up on the stage, and he says, are there any CEOs in the room today? And I'm in the back of the room, and I'm raising my hand like sheepishly because they turn the room dark, and they've got all these spotlights going around, and it's like da 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 drum roll. Because he was making the point that there's never any CEOs in his sessions. Because CEOs are just way too busy and way too important to come to these kinds of sessions. And so I raised my hand. The McDonald's guys are going, go, you're the CEO, tell them. I'm like, raise my hand. He says, come see me at the break. So at the breaks, Dr. Deming had lines that went out the door, like hundreds of people in line with books to sign and all this. So they, they came and got me. I was in the back of the line. They brought me up to the front. He's leaning over like a, on a podium like this. He's leaning over, talking to me. And I'll never forget it. He goes, why are you here? And I said, Dr. Deming, I'm in trouble. I'm in real trouble. And he said, why? I said, I'm about to lose my company. If I can't fix my quality in my company, we're going to go under. And he said, stay behind tonight. We're going to help you fix this. And I began that night to do all the things that Dr. Deming and I decided needed to be worked on at which time they need to be worked on. And I went to seminar after seminar. I took things back. I went to his home. I went to anywhere I could talk to him. I would bring people to the conferences. And slowly but surely, Bama started the transformation. But I can tell you, it's very difficult. It's very difficult because we have to let go of a lot of our preconceived ideas about what business is and what it should be and how it should work and why it should work this way, and why all those ways don't work. Because you have to teach people how to work with each other without competition, without backbiting, without all these things that we do that we don't even realize the psychology of what we're doing is separating people in ranking, rating, and ranking them into different quadrants of how good they are or how important they are to the organization. And Dr. Deming's the first person that looked at me and said, do you know everyone in your organization is important as you? And I'm going, how? Like, <laughs> I don't get that. You know, like, I can go to the bank and borrow money. I can, you know, sign deals. I can go up and meet with customers. He's like, but how are you going to do what you do if you don't have them at the table with you? every step of the way. So we started out walking the company floors and talking and talking and talking and talking to people. We came up with a company mission called People Helping People Be Successful. 
And Dr. Deming blessed that. And I took all the other stuff that I had before that, and we took it out, we threw it away, and we said, this is what we're going to do, guys. We're not in the pie business. We're not in the, you know, manufacturing widgets. We're not in the, let's make, you know, all the customers happy and make us a lot of money. Our mission statement says nothing about making money. It's people helping people be successful. That's what it is. And it's life, it's a life change. I know there's a lot of words on there, and I apologize. But there are life-changing words on this paper right here. Because Dr. Deming taught me about quality and why it had failed at Bama. Because we grew up in a system where my family blamed everything on people who were working on the floor. Have any of you guys ever had, had like summer jobs or where you're like the low man on the, on the totem pole? Right? And when you're the low man on the totem pole, guess where all the problems end up? You ever been balled out by anybody? Even at home, not doing your chores, letting your car break down that mom and dad paid for, not getting preventative maintenance on it, whatever it is, right? Some of it is your fault. But 99.9% .9 of it is, it's our fault. Like, Mom, you never told me I had to go get oil changes every six months. I didn't know. Well, okay, now we're going to know. Here's, here's a little training manual for what you need to do when you first get a car given to you or you're paying it, paying it off somehow. So everything starts with that communication, that walking around, that learning from people what is not working. So I had to make a huge transformation in the company. And this went, it didn't end with me. It started with me, but it didn't end with me. This was supervisors, managers, vice presidents, sales guys, saleswomen, whoever it is. Everyone has to take accountability in everything that goes wrong around here. And people would look at me like, my managers especially were so mad. They're like, what are you talking about? We're, this wasn't our fault. That got made by that guy out there. That screw up happened over at that packaging company. Well, this, we didn't do this. Well, that mixer isn't set up right. You know what? We're all accountable for what goes on around here. I had to teach my management team how to say I'm sorry. I had to teach people how to be accountable. What does that even mean? I'm accountable for something I didn't even do. Well, that means you're going to take it back and you're going to look at your role in how that got messed up. And I want everybody around here to do that. And they're like, salespeople are like, oh my gosh, that got screwed up because we pushed the deadline too fast. We pushed for this project to get done in record time because we thought all the customers would start buying from us. We'd have all this money. Guess what? You didn't set up the, the project correctly. Not everyone got involved. We just did a whole computer software. And this is how, why it's so important that you stay on top of these things every day and talk about them every day. We had a whole software conversion that shut our plant down for four days. And now I'm like, I want everybody on the phones. I want the suppliers on. I want Rockwell on the phone. I want all these people on the phone. And we all went around and talked about where did we all make the mistakes? Mistakes, mistakes, breakdown, communications, mistakes, mistakes. And you know what? When people have to sit in a room like that and talk through every single responsibility that they had that they broke down the project, guess what? It gets really easy for people to see that management incentives do not work. Putting a, a, a bonus program together, putting a, 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 a structure where you rate and rank people together against each other, 
It doesn't work in a system where you're trying to make sure everyone takes accountability. It just doesn't work. You've got to break down those egos and those barriers in your own head that I never do anything wrong. And you've got to flip it around and say, what did I do that was wrong in this process that made it fail? I don't care if you're the president or you're the line guys. We all get around the table when we're doing something and everybody's part of the discussion of what went right and what went wrong. And then at the end of it, we celebrate, we go out and we fix it, and we make it right, and we celebrate all together, not just one person. And the impact that this man had on my life and my career, I tell Kevin this all the time. I'm like, dude, Bama wouldn't be here if it wasn't for your grandfather. I'm positive that we would have gone out of business. But what shocks me is how come not very many companies are run like this? Think about it. The egos in America's corporations and corporations around the world are so giant. No one ever takes accountability at the top. They're always looking for the person at the bottom of the totem pole to fire. In fact, Jack Welch, who's one of the most admired CEOs in the United States, maybe even the world, he ran um, GE for a long time. His philosophy was every year, if you're not firing the bottom 10% of the people that work in your organization, you're not going to be successful. I mean, who determines who's the bottom? People who should be at the bottom because they don't do anything. Okay, so what is this thing called? What is this thing? There's a system. There's a system to all the madness of all the talking with people and going around the company. There's a training system, and it's called the system of profound knowledge. And you can read about it. You can read about it. But I will tell you that what he says when he talks about profound knowledge, is cooperation and transformation to a new style of management. You talk to people in corporate America today and they will not understand what you're saying. Well, we do that. <coughs> no, you don't. For the most part, most people don't. <coughs> a lot of people could never understand Dr. Deming. So I try to take it down to the very personal level. How much do your people trust you? How much do you talk to them? How much time do you spend with them? Are you having fun? Are you getting results? What is your management style? Do you sit with them or on top of them? Are you part of the process or are you outside of it? If you're outside of a process, guys, like the professors are not actually in your process. You, as a student, are your own process. All the professors can do is give you input into suggestions into how you might improve your process. But they are not your process. And if they are, you got to go sit down and talk to them because they're probably reversing what the professor's role is. The professor's role is to help transform you, not to do the transformation and tell you who to be and what to be. That is for you to decide. How you want to apply all the things that they're suggesting to you is your own personal business. So we try to bring that same aspect to the workplace. And one of the reasons why managers can't manage by standing around in a big office and making commands all day and shooting at a bullseye that no one knows how they're going to ever reach it is because they don't work. They don't understand the processes that they're in. 
So it's easy to say somebody go over there and do that if I don't send you some way to, to apply it. So I'm going to finish my remarks with this, this question to you. How can I help you make an impact? And the best way I can tell you how to make an impact, I mean, when I was 25, I didn't know I was going to write books. I didn't know I was going to be running a company. I didn't know I was going to build a company to 400 million. I didn't know any, I didn't know any of that. But with my work with Dr. Deming and with this guy named Stephen Covey, that I was able to be able to learn how to make a life mission statement. And I got into a place where I set my mission statement and I planned for what I wanted to do in my life. I didn't just let my life take me and carry me in all these different places. So I try to advise people to write a personal mission statement. Be very purposeful about your life because I'll tell you, there's no accident that you're here. You are not an accident. We come to this planet with very specific designs that we're supposed to implement. So if you don't know what you're doing and you're just floating along, then you're not being your pr most productive and best self. So I challenge everybody that I work with to please try to write down who you are, what do you want to do with your life, and plan. Plan, plan, plan. And then when it goes off course, you make adjustments to the plan, just like you'd do if you were at work, right? This is the last thing that I wanted to show you is my own personal mission statement. To love and honor every soul, every second. And have fun while you're doing it, guys. Have fun while you're in school. Do good things. Enjoy. Make yourself happy first, then make your family happy. And when you do that, everything's going to be great. Thank you for, for listening today. Mm -hmm.